black you do do. Wanna walk black you? Talk black you? Yes, it's true. Don't you see? James Calm, your half-assed reporter, and today we're going to try to sneak into the Museum of Modern Art and get some pictures of the Robert Rauschenberg retrospective. Stay tuned. As I was uh, pedaling over here on my bicycle, I stopped by Times Square where about two hours ago there was a car crash in which I guess about 12 or 13 people were sent to the hospital and uh, somebody was killed. I'll see if I can uh, splice in some footage. Uh, anyway, this is the the beginning of the Rauschenberg show. I don't know whether I'm going to have to go undercover or not, but I'm not going to press my luck. Well, so they said no flash, but uh, I'm afraid they're going to walk over and tell me I can't do video. So, I'm not going to push it. This is titled Sue. And I believe this is on uh, blueprint paper. I think Reichenberg was not only a fantastic assemblage artist, uh, pre-pop artist, but he also had a lot of interesting ideas about photography. It's a members only preview today. Maybe they'll cut me some slack. Actually, the, uh, the tints of blue on this are lovely. It's titled, untitled Double Rauschenberg. This is one of the early paintings. Titled 22 Lily White, 1950. And uh, yeah, this is great. We've got the numbers on a monochrome. I would say that's probably about 42 by 28. A red star. Untitled 1952. So they just said I can't take video, I'm gonna have to fake it. This is titled Mother of God. Roadmaps on board. This is titled Secrets. 1949, I like it. Untitled. This is titled White Painting 1951. And uh, John Cage raved about this painting, and I've seen this reproduced many times, but uh, it's great to see it in real life. It's the beginning of minimalism. This is untitled Night Blooming. It's when he went from his white series to his black series. one of the black pieces and the only thing you can really see is the reflections of the people in the room. It's a dirt painting for John Cage and pink clay painting for Pete. It's kind of uh, foretells Piero Manzoni. So a couple of gold paintings. Nineteen fifty three this untitled dead painting, small. Robert Ryman came up with this idea about 10 years later. Oh, some of his early abject sculptural pieces. 
It's this untitled black painting enamel and paper. Great surface. This is an iconic piece, the race de Kooning. This is famous uh, tire tread print. I think he did this with John Cage in a Model A. This is red painting from the Broida collection. This is titled Minutia from 1954 and this was used as a prop and they had videos of many of these performances and they had this one in, in particular and it's a wonderful piece but the guard was standing right next to me and I had to stay on the down low okay, this is the section of the real beginning of the classic Rauschenbergs again I'm videoing all this on the down low. It's one of the greats, Rebus and Factum 1 and Factum 2. Oh, this is short circuit. I, I love it because it's got a uh, hidden Jasper Johns painting and some other things in there. Charlene, 1954. Uh, Irving Sandler has referred to Rauschenberg's work from this period as urban folk art. And this particular piece, we're going to see a lot of images and things that he goes back to time and time again. One of them was the umbrella. I think this is bed, which is in the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection. It's actually better as a painting than I remember. Oh, this is Rebus. This is one of the one of the really great pieces. And again, there are gonna be things we're gonna see again and again. One of them is his use of panels attached together, especially a triptych. So it's got uh, paint samples. I think they're saying 177 paint samples along the middle. And drawings by his friend Cy Twombly. Now I was thinking that uh, Rauschenberg somehow was able to combine the uh, influences of his two mentors. One of them was Joseph Albers, who he studied with at Black Mountain. And the other one was John Cage. This is Factum 1 and Factum 2. One of the things I love about Rauschenberg is that he is kind of the symbol that uh, shows the break between abstract expressionism and uh, what they call neo-dada, or you could call it proto-pop art, and he was kind of making fun of the abstract expressionists and their whole idea of you know, this one unique existential thing. There's another classic monogram this is probably maybe one of the most famous of all of Rauschenberg's pieces and he worked on this for years and it actually was hanging on the wall at one point and then he finally changed it around and ended up being like this with the painting laying on the ground. This is titled Gift for Apollo 1959. Here's another example of some things that we're going to see again and again appearing. One of them is art on wheels and this kind of a connection from one thing to another thing. Could be a rope, a chain, an electric cord. This is his famous suite of transfer drawings for Dante's Inferno. And as I understand it, uh, he had split up with Jasper Johns at this point, I guess it was in the late 50s and went to the Caribbean, I think, and was working on this for several months. And this, in a lot of ways, kind of established his whole technique with the transfer drawing. This is Winter Pool.
more of his sculpture. And there is the famous Jasper Johns ale cans. Now, Robert and Jasper were a couple for about eight or ten years. It's a wonderful piece. I had to sneak back in when they had a uh, tour group coming through and I was able to walk around and uh, do my normal uh, video scan on this. Wonderful piece. This is also the beginning of the 60s and Rauschenberg had started to taste a little bit of success so he had a little more money to play around with maybe. This big piece is titled Ace from 1962. And here, you know, although he was kind of uh, breaking away from abstract expressionism, he does use those big swooping strokes, huge brushes, a lot of splashy paint, but he always maintains his grid. This is another great piece. This is Pantomime, 1961. And I love the way he's got the two fans kind of blowing against each other. And as I said, there are certain things he comes back to again and again. One of them are the street signs. He also uses mirror and the, the ropes with things attached to them. There's a suitcase. I wonder if that's a reference to Marcel Duchamp's box in the valise. This was an interesting piece. The chair, I couldn't figure out whether that chair was white and then it was sanded down and painted yellow on one side or whether it was yellow and painted white on the other side. This is titled Gold Standard, 1963. He also uh, uses a lot of interesting colors. Uh, the metallic gold is one thing that he was using. Always has these things sticking out, propped up, the splashes. This is about the midway through the show, and by the time I got here, I was exhausted and wondering whether or not I could hold out. Okay, here is the classic 1960s gallery, the silk screens, his wonderful sculptures. This is about the time that I really became aware of him as a living, actual American artist. And uh, he probably was as big a celebrity as Andy Warhol, although he was not as blatantly <laughs> seeking to be a celebrity. So we've got the nice kind of galvanized metal pieces. Again, I've got guards watching me and uh, so I'm faking it up. So the, the zooms in and zooms out are about as clo close as I can get to having some kind of action. I like this, I was wondering what year that car door was off of, like a 1948 Plymouth. It was a whole period of time in my career when I started uh, doing transfer drawings and lithographs with transfer drawings. This work with the silk screens was also running at the same time that Andy Warhol was using silk screens. Oh geez, look, we can see the stretcher bar coming down the middle of JFK's face on that piece. I didn't notice that before. I think Rauschenberg also should get recognition is playing around with the idea of the photograph, what it represents, the kind of documentary or the truthfulness that a photo might represent and how you can play with it. And uh, the pictures generation people picked up a lot of his ideas and sort of distilled them. But again, you can see his things that he comes back to again and again. We've got the street signs, particularly the stop signs. We've got the spectrum of colors, you know, the, the broad sweeps. And in these, he's kind of replacing the sweeps that you would use to squeegee through a silk screen with the big sweeps that you would use in the, the uh, abstract expressionist brushwork that he's used in some of his other pieces. Always keeps his little tastes of Americana in there. Also, I like the way that he, um, just like the early works where he was doing the monochrome white paintings and the monochrome black paintings, 
some of the silk screens, he limits his, his palette down to just nearly black and white or some other color. Yeah. I was uh, notified that I should look at the footprints in here. Somebody's little dog was tromping around in the studio. I don't know, I hope, I hope Bob didn't like throw the dog out there just intentionally to have him <laughs> make footprints on the painting. The other thing that was kind of poignant for me was thinking back to uh, when a lot of this work was made and uh, how the Vietnam War pretty much had everybody's attention focused on what was happening in the atrocities in Southeast Asia and you know, the nasty political things. Also, one of the things that uh, Rauschenberg always liked to reference was uh, fine art, the high art. You'll see uh, references to Rembrandt, Titian, uh, Velasquez throughout. This is a great piece by Andy Warhol. This is actually called The Rauschenberg Family from 1962. And Andy got a, a photograph of the family. And I was wondering whether that's Robert Rauschenberg, the babe in arms there. But uh, yeah, Rauschenberg was from a very hard scrabble East Texas family. I think it was from Port Arthur, born 1925. This piece was created for EAT, experiments in art and technology. This is called Mud Muse, 1971 to 73, I believe. This is nice. I like the sign <laughs> that they have on the side here. Don't get too close. I mean, in certain ways, this is about, you know, like a Jackson Pollock paint splasher. This is the Cardboard series, and this is when I started to have some doubts about Rauschenberg. I think he's often quoted as saying that uh, there's a big distinction between life and art and that somehow he wanted to work between those two realms but uh, you can only take this as your half-assed correspondence opinion I think he was actually working between Joseph Albers the formalist and John Cage the more spontaneous uh, kind of free-flowing guy This is a nice piece. Again, we've got our kind of found assemblage pieces and then the cords attaching it. I felt very jealous of this because we actually had our water out in our loft when I went and saw this and so I was looking at the water and feeling jealous. This is another great example of him using the formalism of Albers, the way that he's laid out these geometric forms He's got the flat against the volumetric forms and the worn out boxes with what this is titled uh, Nabisco Shredded Wheat and Alpo. This section is titled Travel Motion and Color. In 1975, Rauschenberg traveled to India to collaborate with artisans at the Shibamarti Ashram, a school in the textile center of Ahmedabad founded by Mahatma Gandhi and dedicated to teaching the crafts of making prints, paper, and fabric. There, he fell in love with the silks he saw everywhere, rich and sensuous in both feel and color. The silk prompted him to recognize what had been his own hesitation to fully explore beauty and color in his work. I mostly work in trash, he would recall with a laugh. Back in Captiva, Rauschenberg began making his jammers, embracing, like many artists, did during this time textiles, his materials, and the focus of gravity. He stitched together the silks from India and hung them simply with only the most modest interventions directly from the wall or from rattan poles. The nearly weightless fabric would flutter and dance in response to breezes and people passing by. The title of the series evokes the windjammers sailboats that Rauschenberg could see from his studio, which were likewise designed to catch wind. This little piece is 
almost like a continuation of the cardboards, but the way that these colors go on the back is uh, something I've seen people in Bushwick working with today. The backs are painted with a very fluorescent color that reflects onto the wall. And uh, I almost thought they had some kind of electric lights in there flashing on here, and the guard is standing right behind me, so I had to be real cool about this shot. This is the last major gallery. I would say this is probably maybe the mid-80s until his death in 2008. And, uh, he did a whole series of these pieces dealing with signs and metal things that he'd seen with print on them. I think he called them the gluts and these were based on things that he found in Texas. Uh, he talks about how there was a oil glut and that that affected the entire economy of Texas, his home state. And I think when he was traveling around, he would find debris like this with paint and letters. And uh, he thought that that had some kind of metaphorical relationship, meaning to the, the crash of the economy due to the oil industry. I like this piece with the projections on the frosted glass. Well, if anybody's traveled around out west, you can always trust somebody to get out with their rifle or their pistol and shoot holes through metal signs. It's maybe one of the prime pastimes of the, of the west. You know, and even though he's just picking these pieces out of scrap metal, maybe going to junkyards and things, he still has got an incredible sense of color. This piece is titled Hiccups, 1978. This is a series of uh, 97 lithograph prints, and they're all connected to one another by zippers, and you can unzip them and zip them back together in whichever combination you'd like. Again, you know, some of the patinas that he gets from these found objects, he just, you could not fake this stuff up. And he was very good at using that kind of natural weathered found materials. Had a great feel for those things. It's nice the way he sort of bolts in, collages in sections of metal signs. And the color, we've got that little shot of blue there over the V. Now I looked at some of these and I was wondering if he uh, varnished them with some kind of a dark varnish to sort of give them a patina. This is probably 45 years on in his, his practice. He's still got those same images, same subjects that he's playing with the stop signs, crumpled metals, the color. This is a nice piece. You could probably go back in the calm report and see a show that I covered of his maybe seven or eight years ago. I think he maybe was still alive. It makes me think of David's eye. This is a nice piece because he's got uh, kind of the fabric that he was picking up in India played off with his collages. I think uh, the Crazy Cats are actually silk screens rather than transfer prints. You know, as I was uh, coming to New York and actually going to the shows and seeing these things in their first exhibitions, I had the impression that he kind of cleaned up his act. I felt that maybe in a certain way he was had become too successful and maybe had a lot of people in the studio actually producing the work. And there were a lot of very rich, expensive materials. Well, this is a wonderful piece that really sums up his entire oeuvre. It's on three panels, but it references so many of his classical images. He's got his x-ray there. I think those are astronomical diagrams that he's laid over the skeleton. 
There's his umbrella. I almost call that a parachute. A wheel. Also, it's, it's interesting that he was using a transfer rather than just using the photographs, and I think that's because you kind of uh, slosh the solvent on there and uh, press it against the surface. There's never quite the exact uh, reproduction of the image. It's always kind of uh, hit and miss, kind of spontaneous. There's a certain amount of open, open space in there that's nice. It's a wonderful print. I think uh, Rauschenberg was maybe one of the people that helped bring the print back into popularity in the 60s. And uh, I think he worked out at the Tamron Institute for a while, did several uh, series of prints out there with uh, some of the master lithographers that brought back the whole technique of printing on stone. The background music is a video. I think that he was working with Trish Brown and Merce Cunningham and a lot of dancers over the years. And he's also probably credited as being one of the people that made dance popular again and kind of combined it with performance and happenings and all kinds of things that changed the art world in the early 60s. Bible Bike Borealis, 1991. Silk screen printed chemical resistant varnish and patina chemicals on three plates of brass, bronze, and copper. In the Borealis series, to which this work belongs, Rauschenberg silk screen photographs he had taken onto plates of brass, bronze, and copper, integrating these images with sweeping gesture marks made from the patinas, chemical compounds, and varnishes often used in printmaking. He applied these tarnishing elements in various ways, sometimes barefoot, with rags, skating on a worker's work surface, sometimes with a range of implements, including a mop. Bible Bike, Borealis shows Rauschenberg inventing new technology and processes from the basic tools of printmaking. Rauschenberg's 16-year collaboration with choreographer Trish Brown from 1979 to 1995 was one of the most important artistic exchanges of his career. For the first collaboration, Galicia Decoy, 1975, Rauschenberg created a backdrop of 620 photographic slides showing sites in and around Fort Myer, Florida. This is Holiday Roos, Nightshade, 1991. Silk screen printed chemical resistant varnish water and alma black. Holiday Ruse, a large scale aluminum panel, evokes a printer's metal plate inked up and ready to be run through a printing press. Here as elsewhere, Rauschenberg expresses his appreciation for the medium of print by making its production the subject of a work. Because of its collaborative nature, the process of printing, an ongoing exchange between the artist and printer, greatly appealed to Rauschenberg. He once noted, I've always been attracted and tempted into nearly any situation where the final work was the result of more than one person's doing. That's why I like dance, music, theater, and that's why I like printmaking. Because none of these things could exist as solo endeavors. This is James Calm reporting on Robert Rauschenberg Among Friends here at the Museum of Modern Art. Thank you, Kate.